way, have your way, have your way tonight. And speak to every heart that is listening. And those who will listen later, let the anointing be the teacher who will teach us and address us and call us to the place where we need to be. Many of us tonight, oh God, we are out of our place in you. We are not serving you in the way we should have. And now in the name of Jesus, let there be a strong anointing in this service, in this word, to call people to holy living and righteous living. Bless us all. Help us to understand. Help us to know, Holy Spirit. Help us. Show us the way. Show us how to be strong. Show us how to be courageous. Show us the way unto the cross. The way unto the the way unto resurrection life, the way to the ascended life, the way to the glorified life. Bless and undertake now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome you tonight to our Bible study on the book of Revelation. So tonight, you feel welcome I feel important that you are called by God and God have a ministry for you. There is a ministry awaiting somebody tonight. A special calling God is putting upon your life. And there is somebody that God is going to give a special word. And there's somebody who is in financial need at this time. God is saying to you, sow seed, and he will make a way for you. Shalabababa. 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 Someone of you having problem with the girl child. God going to speak to her and turn her around. But God is saying, you will have to live a life of example to that girl child. To that girl child. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Be strong and of good courage. That is what the Lord is saying to you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bible study on the book of Revelation. Now, somebody texts me. I want to know whether the rapture is before the tribulation, tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or at the end of tribulation. Well, there's not a direct word from God as when it will take place. But if you study the scriptures very, very carefully, you will see when the tribulation will take place. May I say here, there are types and there are hints to us. For example, Lot escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. God brought him out of that place. Enoch 
escape the big flood of this church. Why? God brought him out of it. God did not let him go through it. To that person who asks me that question, here are some hints to you. Study these things. Take about five hours study alone just to explain it. So, one, study the barley. Now, study the harvest in the Bible. Study harvest in the Bible. Barley harvest, wheat harvest, and grape harvest. And you will know better through the barley harvest, which is a softer grain, and the wheat, which is a harder grain, and the grape, which has to be crushed. Two, study the feast of the children of Israel, especially the three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacle. Study the three feasts. Three, study wedding custom of Bible time, like the ten virgins who came to reach the bridegroom. Five were taken, five left behind. There's a custom, a wedding custom, and you must know that. Then, look at the book of Revelation, chapter 1, how it ends, and chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 4, how it begins. By the time you study these four things, God going to speak to you. You will never, you will know whether the rapture is before, midway, or after the tribulation. So that is what I have to say to that. Hallelujah. Today, we are looking at the risen Savior in his glorified form. The risen Lord in his glorified form. I just want to name today's study because I feel God has spoken to me to name it like that. The risen Savior in the glorified form. And it's in the chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Last week when we left off, we, are, we were about verse 9 of chapter 1. We will continue on that line. So let us read verse 9. John, who also am your brother and compa companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patient of Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I know I did some explanation on this verse already, but I want to highlight a couple of things. John mentioned his name. He's the author. He's our brother. 
a brother in the sense that we are related to Christ. And I want all of you here today to know that in Christ we are brothers, we are sisters in God, in Him. We have one Father. The church today is too divided and too much aside. People looking upon people and we doing things like that. But today I want you to know you are my brother. You are my sister. And I love you. He, he went on to say, companion in tribulation. He realized that the time is coming and the time was upon them right at the time he was writing. The church was going through great tribulation. So John is saying, what I am going through, you are going through too. What I am facing, you are facing. And especially so now, in these last times, there are so many troubles, there are so many heartaches, there are so many things that is going on in the world, and so many pressure is coming upon the church, upon believers. I say, let us hold together in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Verse 10. I in the spirit, or I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. I want you to note here, at this point of writing, that the life of John was transformed. He was not operating in the physical or natural senses. The anointing was him upon him, yes. But more so, I believe, as the first part of the word said, I was, or I in the spirit, his whole being, his whole being was wrapped and saturated by the spirit of God. That God was in him at this point. God was in total control over John as he write. The Bible said that holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And this is what John find himself in. He was wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was now using him to write this book. And it was on a Sunday, the Lord's Day. And coming away from John now, John looked behind him, a whore behind me, a great voice 
as a trumpet. Now, John is about to be introduced to our glorified, glorified Savior, glorified Lord. He always knew Jesus and he was very close to Jesus. He was a disciple who lay his head upon Jesus' breast and he heard the words of Jesus. Jesus feed him, gave him to eat. Jesus at Jesus' crucifixion said to John, John, take my mother. Here is her. Look after her. Take care of her. After Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, he, he, he experienced Jesus as a loving, resurrected Savior. But now, John is about to see Jesus. Not as a risen, but as a glorified Lord and God. A lot of us experience Jesus, but we need to have a deeper experience with him. And I trust God before the studies on Revelation is finished that you will come and experience Jesus in a greater, in a glorified fashion. You would know him and the power of his resurrection. And more than that, you will know him and as the ascended Savior, the one sitting at the right hand of God, the one with power, the one with authority, the one with dominion. Yes, you will know that. And your life will be transformed in a greater way. So he heard this powerful voice speaking to him. And the voice was the voice of Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Note, John was commanded by Jesus to write. The writing of the book of Revelation is not from a person's vision, but Jesus Christ, through his angels, spoke to John directly and command him to write. So that is why this book is a blessing to those who read, those who listen to it, and those who keep the word of this prophecy. Write in a book, and then he said, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Seven churches. So he is to write about what Christ was saying to him and the message or the book was to go to seven churches. I want you to note the word seven. In the book of Revelation, the word seven keep occurring over and over and about 50 times you will see seven. 
So the seven churches are listed. Ephesus, Smyrna, Borgamus, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia. These are the seven churches the book was written for and sent to. Seven churches. Not only were the books for those churches, but the books and the message of revelation is for all people. All people. But spe specifically at that time, there were hundreds of church. But Christ chose these seven churches. Why? Because in the seven churches there were occurrences, there were problems, there, there, there was a word for each church and that word also represent a word for people of all ages. And that make the word uh, that make the, the book, that make the letter prophetic. Prophetic. Because these words were for everybody. The seven churches was in Asia Minor and was what we know today as Turkey. Turkey. And that's their location as we could see it there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And being turned, I saw seven, here again, here again, seven. I saw seven golden candlesticks. So, as I said before, when reading, when studying Revelation, you need to take note of the word seven. They have significance. Seven churches, seven candlestick, yes. So as John read, as John turned to see, he looked up, he saw Jesus Christ. John was now in the spirit. So he saw Jesus dear, and he was in the midst, in the midst of the candlestick. The candlesticks are really the churches. Say that. The candlesticks are the churches. Each candlestick represents the, a church that he was going to speak to directly. Hallelujah. In this picture that I have here, I want you to know, in the hand of Jesus was stars. They are representation of the leader or the pastor of the church. The Bible says the angel of the church. So there might be more than one interpretation, 
but I go with the pastor of the church. So in the hand of Christ was the pastors or the leaders, the, the one who was carrying on the church. He had them in his hand. And note, he was in the midst of the church. He was in the midst. He, he looked what was going on. He was walking in the midst of the candlestick. He was the one with the authority, the one with power, the one who was looking at the church, the one who was had his eyes open to see and to know what was going on in his church. Then I noticed he had in his hands also keys. Keys. Why Jesus had keys? Because he took away the keys of hell and death. He had the keys of hell and death. He had all authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. He was completely resurrected. He was completely the risen the Lord and was completely the glorified Lord. He had the keys, he had the authority over this place. And in the midst, verse 13, in the midst of a seven candlestick, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and guard about the pap with the golden girdle. I want you to picture, picture him with that golden girdle. I want you to see Jesus not like he was upon earth and when he walked Galilee or when they crucify him. But now, he was beyond that. He was never to die again. Never to be crucified. Never to be conquered. He did it once for you and for me. He did it once so that we can be saved and be delivered from this present world. But now, he is the resurrected, the glorified Christ. Hallelujah. And in the midst of the seven candlestick, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and covered with a golden girdle. Now, we will take a look at the menorah or the candlestick. John saw seven candlesticks, and Jesus Christ was in the midst of the candlestick. Now we know Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But well, why is the church represented here as a candlestick and seven candlesticks and Jesus Christ in the midst of the candlestick.
The candlestick, as I said, represents the church. The church is a lighthouse in the world. Right now, we are lighthouse sending a message, sending a signal to the lost and to people who need Christ. And at this moment, I believe that God is sending the final message to this church and to this time in which we are living. Therefore, we as Christians, we as the church, should recognize who we are. We might say we belong to this denomination, that denomination, Assemblies of God, we are Baptists, and so forth. But on the sight of God, He looks at us as His children, as He as Lord over the church. When it comes to the church, there's nothing like Assemblies of God, Baptist, or Pentecostal holiness, or, or, or any sort of thing like that. We belong to the Church of Christ. We belong to the Church of Jesus Christ. And He has us in His hand. Now, mind you, I'm not against denomination and what you have an organization and so forth. But let us not put the denomination before Jesus. Let us have him as Lord, as Lord in the church. The church is the true representation of the true light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. No other gospel can be preached in this world. An angel or a next man or next religion or any other such can preach the light. There's only one light. And that is Jesus Christ. And we are representation of that light. So we are candlesticks. We are the candlesticks unto the Lord. And illumination of the truth, the enlightenment of the truth is given to us and is reaching to the world to the dark world, to people who do not know Jesus Christ. The gospel which is the light and the church which is the light of the world is preaching, sending the light to the ends of the earth. Now Jesus said these words, this gospel, this message of salvation, the kingdom of God must be preached to all people before the end of the world comes. And I believe that I am doing a part of it and you are doing a part of it and so many others are doing a part of it, sending a message to this world. The mission of the church is to shine the light in the dark world. We are witnesses of the true light. There is not another light and there is not another person that can bring salvation but through Jesus Christ. He said that I am the way and the truth and the life. No man shall come unto the Father but by him, only we, the church, 
has the message of this time. The seven church. Now, in verse 13, 14, 15, and 16, we see a description of Jesus in the glorified state. I repeat that. In 13, verse 13, verse 14, verse 15, and 16, we see the Word of God describe Jesus in the glorified state. In verse 13, we look at His majesty. Majesty. In verse 14, we look at His beauty, His holiness. In verse 15, we look at His authority, His power. And in verse 16, we look at his glory, the Shekinah glory of God. Now, this same description of Jesus Christ is also found in the book of Daniel. Daniel says, in Daniel 7, 9, I beheld till the throne were cast down. Jones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was as white, and the hair of his head as pure, his throne like a fiery flame, and his wheel as burning fire. Hallelujah. A fiery stream issued and, uh, and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand, ten thousand stood by him. And the judgment was set and the books were open. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which was the horn spoke, I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given the burning to the burning fire. Then in chapter 10 of Daniel it says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in white linen, white linen, whose loins were gored with gold of Upas, his body also like barley, and his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes a lamp of fires, his arms and his feet is colored like brass and the voice of him is like a multitude. So Daniel saw the same thing that John saw the glorified, the resurrected, the authority, the almighty Christ. In Revelation, it says, his head and his hair were like, were white like wool and white as snow. His eyes were, were as a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass as if they were burned in the furnace. And his voice as a sound of many waters. And he had in his hand seven stars. 
out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as a sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and lay his and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So John had a vision and was exactly the same vision that Daniel saw in the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and chapter 10. The exact thing, the ancient of days, Daniel saw. And here we see Jesus. I want you to look at Jesus Christ. His hair on his head represent the, the purity, the holiness. His face shone like the sun and his eyes was a flame of fire. Represent not only his purity, but his freshness. Out of his mouth was a two-edged sword. He held his seven stars in his hand. And he had a golden sash around him. His clothes were down to his feet. And his feet like a burning brass. I want you to look at this Jesus Christ. He was no more the man that walked the streets of Galilee. He was no more the man who suffered and died. But when I see strength, I see power, I see authority, I see the man who is more than a man. He is God man, the son of man. Hallelujah. The son of man, I see. John said he fell at his feet. John, when he saw Christ uh, as ascended, as the risen, as the glorified Christ, he fell down at his feet as death. But John, this was an experience he never had. But John, he always looked at Jesus Christ as the one who was with him, fishing, walking, preaching, healing. But today he saw Jesus Christ as the man of authority, the man of power, the man of dominion. In verse 18 say, I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So I want you to see Jesus holding in his hand the keys of hell and death. That Satan is conquered. Satan is powerless. Satan is under his feet. Satan has no power over Christ. Jesus is Lord and Lord forever. And Jesus said to John, Write the things which thou hast seen. And the things which are, and the things which shall be here after. And we will continue this next week.
we will look at verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which thou art, and the things hereafter. And we will see Jesus Christ. Today we look at him as the risen Lord. John was terrified when he saw Jesus. Every part of this book of Revelation is prophetic. All of chapter 1 is prophetic. All of chapter 1 is prophetic. God looks in the form of a son of man. He had a sword in his mouth. That does not mean he had a literal sword. But the word that came from his mouth was powerful I was anointed I had the effect of a sword a mighty sword that crushed Satan and the wicked one he had upon his waist a belt of truth a belt of faithfulness he had on a robe that was a priesthood robe. His face was shining. He was full of the glory of God. His feet like brass speaks of judgment. The sash around him speak of his faithfulness and his faithfulness towards us. Who are Christians and his snow head speaks of purity. This what we see is one, a man of one, a mighty one, in the midst of seven candlesticks. Sword of fire from his mouth, holding the pastors, the angels of the church, and had the keys of hell and death, and we will reign with him. Next week we go to verse 20, we recap 19 and go to 20, and we conclude chapter 1 next week. And we go the book uh, to chapter 2 and we will study Ephesians, the church. Praise the Lord. I want you tonight as you go, look to Jesus. As a man sitting in the Godhead. A man of authority. A man that is glorify a man who has all power, all authority upon this earth. And more than a man is God, is Lord, is almighty, is all powerful, he is God almighty, he conquers Satan as his angels. I want you to see Jesus who he is. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, I pray for your people that everyone would understand the full meaning of what you are saying to us. I pray that your anointing will be mighty tonight upon your words speaking to hearts. Your anointing will teach and continue to teach. Your anointing will rip, apart, will rip apart the works of Satan, the powers of hell, the thrones of the evil one. And come, Lord Jesus, come. 
Remember those who are not saved. Those who don't know you as the light, as the true one. Jesus Christ. The true man. Who is the true God. And there is none like unto him. In this world, he came to save you. He came to deliver you. He came to heal you. And tonight I pray for your salvation. In the name of Jesus, let Jesus Christ come into hearts. Come into souls tonight. Break the powers of sin, the powers of the devil, the powers of the evil one. And break unbelief in Jesus' name. We praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. This is Pastor David saying, we meet on Sunday for our worship service. We have created additional space and seating capacity can hold to you if you want to come to our church. We are at 59 Cranberry Crescent. So I want you to know you can come to church. You text us, say, Pastor, I want to come to church. And we will have a place for you. Sunday at 10 o'clock. You can't miss it. You can't miss worship. God bless you. Pastor saying God blessing. Have faith in God. Hallelujah.